co-hosts on this uh, wonderful Wednesday, the Admiral Bill Stubblefield Tuesday. It is a wonderful Wednesday. Every day is a wonderful day. I've worked you uh, every day this week, haven't I? Yes, you have. You getting tired? You, I, I was going to say, are you getting tired? <laughs> I'm always tired. <laughs> He's been on all three? Yeah. Yes. Wow. Monday, his regular day, and then uh, yesterday. Well, Filling Johnny, in. Johnny the yeah. Bot is in the basement right now. Uh, with uh, the, the Medicare stuff, he's yeah. he's too busy. I thought yesterday's discussion between the uh, uh, Riley and uh, and Steve was a was a good discussion. Steve Wendelin, yeah. the Democratic yeah. candidate for the second congressional district seat, Riley Moore, the Republican. We had them in studio live for an hour together yesterday. It was their only appearance together yeah. during this election season. Sure. And supposedly, at least the impression I had, was the first time they'd actually met. Uh, yes, actually, that is correct. So, absolutely. Uh, Maria Lawrence in here as well, former editor of the Journal, and uh, now devoting her free time to Hospice of the Panhandle. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Good to be here always with my friend Bill and with my friend Rob. Well, it's nice to be. It's friends. a friendly group around the table this yes, morning. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. We're looking at the West Virginia Secretary of State race, and the candidates are uh, Democrat Thornton Cooper. And Republican Chris Warner. Chris, of course, is the brother of the current Secretary of State, Mac Warner. And he'll join us at 935. The Democrat is Thornton Cooper, who joins us via telephone right now. Mr. Cooper, good morning. Thank you so much for being with us today. Well, thank you for the opportunity to talk with the folks in the eastern part of the state. Far away. I'm so, hey, do you by chance know Michael Carl? I have met him once. I think uh, I think we, he, he went to Yale at some point, and I'm, I went there as an undergraduate. Yes, yes, I, 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 right. Correct. I didn't know if you guys had met or not to have yeah, Yale. Yes, we had. I used to work at the Public Service Commission for uh, about twenty-five years, and I think I met him in that context. Yeah. Okay. Very good, because he's a Yale as well. I, I believe he is. Yes. <laughs> Let's talk about your time at the Public Service Commission, and uh, tell me a little bit about what you did there and what you accomplished. Okay, so I, I, I didn't regulate water, I didn't regulate electricity, I didn't regulate natural gas, so don't get mad at me for what PSC does <laughs> on your <laughs> utility bills. What I regulated uh, were such things as limousines, taxi cab companies, garbage companies, uh, and I was involved in a federal court case. Uh, and I am an attorney, and uh, I argued before the uh, United States Court of Appeals for the Northern District relating to the uh, landfill in Hedgesville, that was one of the things that I, I worked on. I retired in 2005, but uh, I worked for the Public Service Commission from 1981 through 2005. 29 years in, in state government. I've 29 years of experience in state government, uh, mostly as an attorney and administrator. I can go in more detail about the, what I did at the PSC, but I think you probably want to go and talk about some other issues. Sure. Uh, one of those is you've been involved in a number of court cases with prior secretaries of state dating back to 1981. Can you tell us about some of the major ones there? Well, the first one was in 81. Uh, thank you for your research. But uh, I've always been trying to look out for the people in the eastern part of the state. My uh, my father's from Tucker County, and my, his father was from Frederick County, Virginia, and my paternal grandmother was from the Cumberland area, Fl a place called Flintstone. So... And my mother's born in Alexandria. I just want to give that uh, perspective. I look out for the people in the eastern part of the state. Uh, and what had happened after the 1980 census, the uh, people in the eastern part of the state were represent were in a congressional district. It was almost half the area of the state. And the, the legislature dropped the ball in 1981 in terms of redistricting because I gave them a plan. They didn't do it. So I drafted a lawsuit. Uh, I brought my, my brother John Cooper in uh, Tucker County where he lives. And uh, we challenged the redistricting, and A. James Manchin was listed as a defendant. The funny thing, in that case, he agreed with us. He said what the legislature did was unconstitutional, but the then attorney general wouldn't let him his position be put on the briefs filed in the federal court. A. James later filed a lawsuit against uh, Chauncey Browning, successfully saying that when you sue a secretary of state or other uh, statewide executive branch official, that person's opinion, not the position of the attorney general, is supposed to be reflected in the pleadings. So that was an important case. What we did get, uh, it, although it wasn't exactly the plan I came up with in the 1981 uh, litigation, we, we did get the thing fixed so that the people in, in the eastern part of the state uh, were not discriminated against. And then at 10 years later, when they went down from four to three districts, 
they I, I fought against what I call the gerrymander, which had a district which went from Harpers Ferry all the way over to Point Pleasant and was not completely violated, in my opinion, the uh, compactness requirement in the state constitution. And I came up with the closest uh, redistricting plan numerically in the history of West Virginia when we, uh, as far as I know, it still is, only 15 from the largest to the smallest districts in population. And that plan was supported by most of the people in the legislature, but the Senate president didn't want it because that would have met uh, one of the districts would have had his congressman, Alan Mullahan, in the same district where my congressman, Bob Wise, lived. And so that they, they didn't do anything in the regular session. They came back and, with this plan that went from uh, Point Pleasant to uh, Harper's Ferry. We challenged it in court, a uh, published case called uh, Stone v. Heckler. We were unsuccessful in getting it set aside, and we were stuck with this this thing for about 30 years finally I also submitted redistricting plans after 80 cents 90 census 2000 census 2010 census 2020 census after the 2020 census we did get the state redistricting of two districts and finally all the eastern part of the the, the uh, state uh, at least around the eastern panhandles in one congressional district which i think is a lot better for the people in your end of the state agreed state yeah uh you believe that the Secretary of State in West Virginia should make it easier for people to vote. How would you do that? Well, you, first, uh, the uh, Secretary of State uh, is an executive branch officer, so it's the legislature that has the power. Uh, just as when I work for the Public Service Commission, you, you do what the legislature says, uh, unless it you know, violates the federal constitution or the state constitution. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I, I wish to have statutory changes by the legislature, to allow people to vote uh, by mail without going through all the jumping off over all these hurdles, saying, "Well, I've, I've got to have a scheduling conflict, or I'm going to be ill." Just say, "I want to vote early by mail," and and not all this other uh, uh, all these other hurdles, which make it harder for people to vote. So I think people should be able to vote early by mail without giving an excuse. Er, early in place voting, um, uh, that is, in person voting, which we already have. And of course, voting on election day. Let the you know mountaineers always free. Let the people make the decision which way they want to go about it. Would you use drop boxes too, or just strictly the U.S. mail? Not in this state. West Virginia is the second most rural state in the country. We do not have any big uh, urban areas. I mean, I live in South Charleston. Charleston's next door. We used to, Charleston used to have eighty, I think eighty-five, eighty-seven thousand people in the. 1960 census, it's down to 48,000, and of course the Jefferson County, Berkeley County are growing, but no, we don't. We don't have the the uh, demographics of people being concentrated in one area, which, which might make it okay in other states. No, I'm not for doing it in West Virginia. Of course, it's up to the legislature. Bill Stubblefield. Uh, good morning, uh, Mr. Cooper. Uh, we on this ballot is Amendment One uh, to prohibit medically assisted suicide. Uh, it's my understanding that uh, there are various components to this, but only one component is on the ballot. Uh, you've taken exception to this. Would you discuss it, please? Oh, in great detail, or, or whatever you want. First, what's on the ballot is the, is a, a constitutional amendment which covers many things which are not in the in the ballot language and therefore uh... in line with what i did in nineteen ninety five uh... uh... nineteen ninety five the the nineteen ninety four the infrastructure improvement amendment then uh... secretary of state ken heckler did not properly publish the full text of the amendment which that's been required in the state constitution article fourteen section two since nineteen i mean since eighteen seventy two and in the west virginia code chapter three since nineteen seventy two all he did was publish the ballot language. The amendment was narrowly ratified. I challenged it after reading the uh, prior decisions involving Article 14, Section 2, and I was trying to invalidate the thing. I was unsuccessful, but if you read the, uh, the what we call the syllabus points of the opinion, the state Supreme Court agreed with me. It's a mandatory duty to publish the full text of the amendment. And so ever since then, I have been monitoring what every Secretary of State has done. And if he or she has just published the ballot language, I've called them up and they've corrected it. Uh, this is the first time I've had to threaten to go to court 
uh, well, actually twice, once six years ago with, with Mac Warner, again this year, because he did, failed to publish the full text of the amendment, as is required in state code and the constitutional amendment. So first, what you see in the ballot is not what is actually uh, in the, the amendment. Secondly, as a result of my saying I was going to go to court, uh, Mr. Warner finally did agree to get the, the uh, full text of the amendment published. It should have been published in the, in the uh, journal on or about October 23rd, because that was the day it was published in the uh, Charleston Gazette Mail. So if people actually read their legal ads, they will see the full text, which is very different from what the ballot language is. But still, uh, the, excuse me, but still that avoids the, uh, for the t- typical voter. They do not read, for one thing, the journal is uh, limited distribution, and the ones that do read the journal rarely re- read the legal ads. So what we have in front of the voter is only one component of, the, uh, of what the language would say. Now, absolutely the, correct. You're absolutely yeah. correct. Another now, reason to vote against it. But. Yeah, <laughs> but, uh, but my point is, if it, if it passes, the fact there's only one component on the ballot, will that invalidate the um, uh, the results of the um, of the vote? Well, I'm not sure because certainly under my case, State X Rel Cooper v. Caperton, which was handed down in 1996, if you don't publish the full text or you wait really really late uh, to publish the full text, then there's a real question about whether anything would be valid except uh, what was in the ballot language and the amendment goes way beyond assisted suicide it also deals with euthanasia and i'm using that abstract noun in the same sense that i use the verb euthanize such as when we had put down my cat comes from the greek words for good death euthanasia there when the intent is to put to death a pet or a human being that's homicide okay we're that is not assisted suicide. That's homicide. Homicide is what Dr. Kevorkian went to prison for. I'm not for, uh, I'm not for homicide, but I am for, uh, I do favor, uh, under narrow uh, constraints, the, the right for people to have assisted suicide. And I belong to two groups, or donate to two groups, which are pushing for that and have succeeded in other states. But as a person who's 74, I want the right, it should, st- I'd like to live to be 100, okay? But if I if I have a, uh, I'm having a very rough time, I want the option of uh, exiting life stage without having to blow my brains out or jump off a bridge or jump in front of a train. And the best way to do that is through the, you know, if a, if a physician uh, were to prescribe the way of doing that. But our, our legislature, instead of giving me that right, they're doubling down and trying to tie the hands of future legislators, legislatures to give me that type of, uh, of, of comfort and compassion and dignity. So uh, was that responsive to your question? Uh, yes, it was, uh, I think. Uh, my, <laughs> question, my question was, if it does pass, the fact there's only one portion that the voters realize what they were voting for, do, well, uh, that, is that grounds for a legal challenge to invalidate the results of the, of the yes, vote? Yes, sir, it is. It, it is because under State Ex Rel. Cooper v. Caperton, the situation was that the text and the ballot language did not contradict each other. In this case, I mean, in other words, the the text of the amendment was summarized not inaccurately by the ballot language. But when you're talking about two completely different things, homicide and suicide being in the same constitutional amendment, and the ballot language only refers to suicide, that is a huge, huge uh, uh, you know, gap between what was in the ballot language and what was in the actual text of the amendment. Maria Lawrenson. Good morning. Uh, so, so tell us a little bit why Secretary of State, why now? Um, uh, obviously, you've had a long, um, illustrious uh, state career and then private um, private practice career as well. So what what makes you want to do this now? Okay, let's t- first thing, I, I, I think without being a modest, I'm the most qualified person in West Virginia who has not been Secretary of State <laughs> to actually, you know, run for it. Uh, secondly, uh, in, in 1989, I worked very hard to defeat a proposed constitutional amendment on the ballot September 9, 1989, which would have taken away the rights of West Virginians to vote to elect their Secretary of State, to elect their Treasurer, and to elect their Commissioner of Agriculture. 
had that constitutional amendment been ratified, we wouldn't be having this conversation. You wouldn't be having a conversation with Mr. Warner after I'm done because we that power would all be vested in the governor's office. We have only then had three uh, statewide uh, executive branch elected offices, and I worked very hard to uh, to defeat that. And it occurred to me that if I did not run, uh, nobody was going to run on the Democratic side because uh, the, the person most likely to run for Secretary of State as a Democrat would have been Doug Scaff Jr., he, who was my delegate, and he switched parties uh, last year. And uh, I said, well, I'm not going to uh, let the, the Democratic Party down, uh, and I think I could really do an excellent job if I were honored to serve in that capacity. Is that responsive to your question? It does. It does. Thank you. Our guest is Thornton Cooper. He is a candidate for Secretary of State in West Virginia. You have been critical of your opponent, Mr. Warner, over an ethics complaint reg no, sir. regarding a PAC. I have not said anything about my opponent. Other people have been critical of him. I've not. I, I've only met him once. Uh, Mr. Uh, Chris Warner and I shook hands at a Meet the Candidates thing uh, in Beckley. I have not said anything publicly. Again, I mean, there's plenty of newspaper uh, articles about him, but I've chosen not to make that an issue. I, I've run on my own record. I'm older than he is by 12 years. <laughs> I'm the one that has more experience, so I have not I have not brought up anything against uh, Chris Warner uh, on terms of those complaints. I mean, not not in any, any public forum have I discussed that. Uh, so, but my, go my, ahead. I just want to make that clarification. I'm running on my record, not against Mr. Warner's you know, the, the newspaper stories about him. I appreciate okay? I appreciate the correction on that. Do you have any concerns, I'll put it in a more general term, do you have any concerns about your opponent in this race? Uh, it's been These things have been covered by the newspapers. I, I read a book about him called Elephant Wars, but the point is I want to focus on West Virginia's futures. I mean, you'll have the opportunity to ask Mr. Warner about what he did or didn't do, I, I would like you to ask me about what I would do. I'm just saying in terms of your your audience, and I really appreciate mm -hmm. the opportunity to be on your radio show, but I want to talk about what I would do rather than focus on what Mr. Warner is alleged to have done. Well, I think that's a refreshing attitude, and I would be happy to walk down that path with you. Then we discussed what you would like to do in regards to making um, voting more accessible in West Virginia. Uh, your predecessor has done what many consider to be a, a relatively thorough job in cleaning up the voter payroll, the, uh, the voter, uh, uh, not the payroll, sorry, the voter registration lists in West Virginia. Would you that, That's the continuing problem which has gone on yes. for decades. The very first time I ran for office, I made the mistake of sending out postcards to everybody on the voter registration office. I said, my, uh, and I didn't put. I had the person, that, the name of the person I addressed it to, but didn't put or current occupant. So I got back dozens and dozens and dozens of postcards or letters, and I said, well, I want to take these either to the county clerk and city clerk. Said, Nah, they won't do anything about it. And I said, No, we've got to, we've got to clean that up. But you do understand that when you're cleaning it up, you do not want to remove people from the roles who are still living at the places that are, are on the voter registration offices. And that happened to my niece a few years ago in, Char in South Charleston. She went to vote, and somebody with a similar name as hers had moved in within Kanawha County. The Kanawha County clerk's office had messed up and taken my relative's name off the precinct list. She went to vote. They would not let her vote uh, because her, her name had been incorrectly taken off. She voted a provisional or challenge ballot, and then the poll fish officials messed up a second time by not having her uh, sign her name on the outside of the envelope. They, they messed up. Her vote didn't count. And so when we talk, if this happens uh, in lots of places where people get too zealous on correcting the voter rolls. You have to give every opportunity for folks to be able to say, no, I'm still living at that place. No, I'm still registered to vote at that place. I just want to make that point to you because – especially the Republican Party. They, they put all this stuff about voter fraud, which is nearly non-existent in this country. There are a lot of problems. The voters' rolls will always have millions of people listed who are not where they are because we're a mobile society. So, that, that, I hope that was responsive to your question, but proceed. But you, you would continue, however, to make sure that those who are on the voter list are actually residents of the state of West Virginia and alive? Of course, of course. And alive. How, how yeah. would you and like alive? to run for office? 
and you try to rely on those roles and they have all these people who don't live in at the residence that they're located at this isn't a question to me about fraud we all want i want accurate government records i mean i work for state government as i said for 29 years i don't want incorrect uh records uh at any level i mean that i mean my gosh we have to depend uh, on the accuracy of records to proceed in life, including governmental records. So clearly I want those things updated. I, but we have to be careful when we remove people's names without giving them the opportunity. And that's a problem that's right before the U.S. Supreme Court today, where the, over, I'd say, overzealous governor of Virginia uh, took some people's names off or said they weren't even American citizens, at least one was. So... The problem is we all agree that the record should be c- correct, but we've got to be careful how we do it. How big an issue is this? I've been hearing for the last 25 to 30 years, Secretary of State have made a their principal thrust in cleaning up the records, purging all the people that are dead or moved out of state. You would think after 25 or 30 years, we would have a fairly representative uh, voter registration. Is it, is, is it a major problem? No, I just think this will always happen because we're a mobile society. The problem is you just got to be diligent on it. And, of course, a lot of county clerks look at the, you know, the obituary columns. That's one way for them to to uh, update things but we got a third of a billion people in the united states we we pride we pride ourselves on being uh a uh a, a mobile society i mean when i went to yale i mean it was like i had a different uh, address you know, i mean I, not my that's not where i registered to vote at but i had four different addresses the four years i was there when i went to w college of law i i lived in different places each time some people actually register in the college town where they are so if, if you do that, you, the chances are, are more than 50% that the next year you're not going to be at the same address. There's nothing wrong with the fact that, that uh, you know, people move around, but a lot of people are not diligent about uh, informing the uh, uh, voting people, the, the uh, county uh, clerks, uh, about the fact they've moved. And so I don't see that as, a, as a, something wrong with our system. You just got to keep up to date on it. I mean, I, 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 it's not that it causes fraud. It's just I like to have accurate records. Is, is that responsive to your yeah, question? It, it does, and you're making my point that it's. Uh, uh, I think there's a lot more uh, negativism toward our voter rolls than I believe actually exists. I think over the years we've done a pretty good job. We're never going to get perfect, but at least we've been making an attempt to keep the, ver- uh, the voting registration Fairly I agree with you. I agree exactly with what you just said, sir. I agree with what you said. And we, but we are a mobile country, and it will always be a problem that uh, some people will be listed on a voter registration list who no, are either dead or no longer listed. They're not a cause for fraud, but a cause to, you know, we, we don't want to rely on incorrect information. It causes problems. I have... I'm one of the few people running for statewide office that's actually worked in an election as an election official. And I have, uh, you know, uh, recruited dozens of people because I'm a Democrat and I'm the party chairman, Democratic Party chairman in South Charleston, used to serve on the, the county Democratic Executive Committee, to get Democrats to the polls. If you guys think there's fraud uh, out there, go ahead in the next election and volunteer to work in election. Go through election school. And you will find a lot of this stuff you hear on TV is not correct. It's just there's a very complicated process, and the reason it's there is because we did have a lot of voter fraud in the 1960s and 70s. Indeed. In fact, I collected hey, newspaper clippings in Kanawha County. I'm going to cut you off because I'm, I'm out of time here. I, I appreciate yours. Where can we go to find out more about your campaign? Give me a quick okay. answer. Okay, www.thorntoncooper.com. Uh, there's also an article about me on, on uh, ballotpedia.org, and I attached to, to my website uh, an article, uh, a, a blog, and also an interview by Mr. Richard Urban a few uh, weeks all right, ago. That's it. That's all the time I got. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thank you, Thornton. Thank you. <laughs> brevity. Brevity. Got us some brevity there.